Thanks, John. It's uh, always interesting to hear my life uh, as it's viewed by other people. I, uh, I love doing research, <coughs> but every weekend I put on my other identity and go to a farm and get out and work with animals and the gardens and things like that. So um, it's a pleasure to be here again, as I said. And uh, I asked Louise what she wanted me to talk about today. And she said, well, I'd like you to talk about living with lymphedema. And then I'd like you to think about if you have any new findings from any of your research that we haven't heard. So uh, I'm going to do living with lymphedema first, and then you'll have to bear with me one more time today to hear about a study we just completed. Um, we had multiple funding sources for the program of research that I had at Vanderbilt over the past 14 years, and have been very fortunate. Uh, and what you see here are the doors to the School of Nursing at Vanderbilt that I go in every morning when I go to work. And I'm very blessed to work in an, a wonderful environment and a wonderful institution with wonderful people. Over the years, we have conducted many studies to learn more about what it's like to live with lymphedema. And actually, one of the first studies I ever conducted was uh, a comparison study looking at symptoms and problems experienced by women with breast cancer-related lymphedema um, compared to the same issues in women who had not developed lymphedema but had breast cancer. I found there were some distinct differences in those two uh, patient populations. Over the years, we specifically asked people with lymphedema about their swelling and how that felt, but also other symptoms or problems that they had that might be associated with their lymphatic dysfunction. Because I'm a nurse, I was trained to think holistically about the human body. And um, I never came at this uh, from a personal perspective that swelling was the only thing that happened to you when this uh, lymphedema arose. Okay? So we've obtained information from people who have swelling in different parts of their body so we can learn more about the similarities across the patients, uh, regardless of where the swelling is and if there's anything that's unique or different depending on the swelling. And this is the kind of information that can inform physicians, surgeons, and therapists about how to best help people navigate their life with someone with lymphedema. So I'm going to quickly, in a few minutes, talk about symptom experiences as reported by patients. These are not what I think. These are what years of data that we've collected from patients actually show. And we're going to talk about it in the context of physical, emotional, social, and spiritual issues. We're going to talk about how some of these symptoms come together to create challenges for maintaining a quality of life that everyone would like to have. Briefly touch on what I perceive to be the goal of every therapist and healthcare professional, which is to help people who have lymphedema build a healthier life. And I'm going to challenge the people in the audience to expand their, their definition of definition of lymphedema to be more inclusive so we can begin to do more holistic assessments of patients and work more on, towards a healthier lifestyle, not just swelling reduction. So I was privileged in June to be at an international conference where John and I spent some quality time together talking about the study that we just uh, discussed with you. And the World Health Organization is actually sponsoring a committee of international scientists because they want to begin to track lymphedema information, information in some of their large epidemiological studies. So this is a very positive move for the world of lymphedema, but the World Health Organization has actually decided to recognize that this is a real condition that warrants world attention. So the WHO has organized lymphedema into three body segments. And I'm going to just tell you about these, and then the data I present about the symptoms and experiences of living with lymphedema is organized around these three segments. Who classifies midline lymphedema as lymphedema that occurs from the top of the head to your groin? Okay. Upper extremity, your arms and hands, and lower extremity, your legs and feet. So these are the three working groups that we were broken into to try to help them decide what type of things they needed to track in their databases to better understand lymphedema occurring in these specific parts of the body. So I'm going to start with midline. That happens to be the group I was part of when we were all in Scotland. 
And uh, I do a lot of work with head and neck cancer related lymphedema, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But uh, this is just to give you an idea. This is one of our patients at Vanderbilt who had 15 months after her head and neck treatment, lymphedema in her face and in her neck, which you can't see very well. But this is a patient who had lymphedema, who had head and neck cancer treatment 12, uh, six years ago. This is looking down through their nose into their throat. And this is their epiglottis, the flap that covers your food tube. And see how thick and boggy it is? So we know in patients who've had head and neck cancer treatment that they swell outside where you can see it and inside where you can't unless you scope them. We'll see more of this later. But we also know, unfortunately, based on our recently concluded study, that almost 100% of patients who are treated for head and neck cancer end up with some form of internal and external lymphedema that stays with them the rest of their life. And this is a very new finding in the science. Okay, hold on a minute. So we've done a lot of work uh, talking to patients and doing symptom survey development to try to get an idea of what kind of symptoms people experience depending on where their lymphedema is. So we've looked at patients with head and neck cancer, and when we ask them about their symptoms, we ask them first if they have them. And we have a structured document that we ask them to complete. Then we ask them on a scale of one to five how severe this problem is physically to you, how much is it really uh, apparent to you. But because I'm a nurse, I also know that with every symptom that you have, there's an emotional response to it. So we then ask how much distress or emotional bother is associated with symptoms. So what I've done is just pull out for you uh, on this first column here. These are the most common reported symptoms in patients who have had a neck lymphedema. They feel uncomfortable, their skin feels tight, their neck is stiff, their skin is very hard and firm, and this happens very quickly for them. This may be hard and firm by the time they're done with their treatment for their kids. They are hoarse, they have problems sleeping, they can't breathe very well. Think about that swelling I showed you inside their throats. Uh, their voice changes, they feel like something's stuck, they're tired all the time, and then they just complain about the swelling, which can actually get so big they can't see. Because their eyelids full shut. So those are the most common symptoms. But when they have symptoms, the symptoms that are the most severe don't necessarily match the most common ones. Okay? So you'll see there's some overlap, but you'll also notice that patients who have head and neck lymphedema have, when they experience these particular issues, very severe problems with movement of their tongue, opening their mouth, the swallowing problems. Think about all the, body, all the functions of your life that's impacted when you have these issues. Taste changes problems talking, and very difficult communication uh, issues with other people sometimes, and staring, because they have highly visible swelling in their face and neck. Uh, that is very hard to camouflage. But the, the ones that bother them the most for an emotional one are some of these movement problems. But this is an outcome of some of the movement restrictions. Many of them can't drive because they can't move their head anymore. And this is emotionally very problematic. And this communication issue, not being understood, is a problem, and this is not just with people who have had a laryngectomy. These are people who have their throats intact, but because they're so swollen, they can't communicate. So you've seen, this is a fairly complex series of symptoms to navigate if you have had head and neck cancer, and you now have lymphedema from it. So what do they tell us? And this is just a couple of quotes from patients regarding their body image. My neck is different, just the way I look in general. I don't look sparkly anymore. I didn't have jowls before I got the swelling. Many of them isolate themselves socially because they're embarrassed with how they look or how they sound. And tell us it's hard for me to get close to anybody anymore. I don't want anybody touching me in my face, my mouth, my lips. So think about what that has to do for intimacy. 
you don't want to be kissed because you don't want your mouth touched. So I get claustrophobic if they're in a closed space. There's a lot because uh, there's just a lot of issues that they begin to experience. And this is pretty different than people who have swelling in other parts of their body for many of these issues. Keeping in the midline frame, this is the trunkal swelling, which I look at from the shoulder down to your groin for the most part. And you're going to see some similarities, the heaviness, tightness, and things that we talked about when the swelling's in your head and neck. But you're also going to see that these patients report a high degree of sadness or depressive symptoms. And the trunkal swelling seems to uh, have a different kind of functional impact. It doesn't impact breathing or swallowing, but they can't move, play, run, and do some of the leisure activities and hobbies that they used to use. They feel tired, but they lose total confidence in their body to perform as a normal, functioning, physical specimen. That's what one person described to me. I'm not a normal functioning physical specimen anymore. Concerns about appearance and a loss of self-confidence. So these are the most frequently com commonly reported symptoms. And these all occurred in over half of 300 patients with trunkal swelling that we talked to. So these are fairly prevalent. But again, there's a little bit of difference in the pattern of what actually is the most severe and you will see sex is starting to emerge in the trunk patients and partners' interest in sex as the highest intensity rating symptom. Okay? When patients are having sexual issues in their relationships, this is a big problem. On that scale of one to five, these are fours and fives that you see here. Okay? And emotional distress, you're going to see sexuality appear here. But you're also seeing these nagging things in the U.S. that we call lack of confidence in insurance and insurance frustration. This has to do with the inability of patients to obtain resources to care for their swelling. And in the U.S., coverage is much better for arm therapy, if you have lymphedema, than trunkal therapy. So these patients are very uh, angry because they don't have the same benefits from our health plans to get trunkal compression and things like this as breast cancer patients who have arm swelling might have. From the trunkal perspective, they talk a lot about wardrobe altercation, uh, alteration and feeling distorted in the way they look, but they don't feel professional in, anymore. And the edema in the abdomen, as you see here, can cause some problems similar to what we see with the head and neck. If they bend over, they can't breathe. So swelling in your abdomen and swelling in your head and neck can impact your respiratory status and set you up to be at higher risk for things like pneumonia and other respiratory complications. We'll move into the upper extremity segment now. This is um, data that we have collected over about 10 years in patients who survived breast cancer and have lymphedema. Again, common symptoms from the other segments, having this tightness, swelling. But the patients complain a lot of pain in their arm, and that is somewhat different than the other areas in the midline that we just talked about, where we don't get a lot of frequently occurring complaints of pain. People may say lymphedema is not painful in the arm, and patients, if you talk to them, will tell you that it is. Uh, and their experiences may be varied, but pain is pain. If someone tells me we have, they have it, I believe them. And some of it can be achy, but these patients are also um, uh, having physical activity, curtailment. They have appearance concerns and body image issues, problems sleeping, and fatigue. And again, these are the most frequently reported. So imagine that. You live your life knowing that you have a chance of having these happen on a fairly recurring uh, basis. The most intense symptoms with the biggest complaint factors are still the insurance, the sexuality issues, giving up hobbies or other things that they have loved to do, and decreased social activity. The ones that cause the most emotional distress, and that with some patients result in very serious consequences to marriages and partnerships have to do with the anger about the resource allocation, not being able 
to get everything they want, even though they're the most highly covered patients in terms of insurance coverage in the U.S. They still can't get garments that about once a year. And but in this case, the partner's lack of sex and being less sexually active is a true emotional roller coaster. And when we talk to the partners, many times they tell us that part of their lack of interest in sex is that once, the, once their wife or spouse started swelling, they became very concerned that it would hurt them. They viewed them as healing from their breast cancer treatment and surgery, with the lymphedema as being permanent. And, and so there's a lot of things that can play into the partner's lack of interest in sex and being less sexually active, but they're big issues. And from the patient's perspective, and some of these are going to seem very familiar, but the demon's like a chain around my neck. I don't understand why science and research cannot find ways to treat it more effectively. I get peeved that someone just doesn't think it's as important as other illnesses. The younger patients talk to us about their fear for their future and whether or not they may become disabled over the years, having survived breast cancer at 40 years old, and thinking they may live to be 70 or 80. Will their arms still be functional at that time is a big question that we are often asked to answer. Uncertainty about how big their arm may get and feeling lack of control over that. And again, body image issues, not feeling pretty, even when they're all dressed up. Lower limbs, again, you're going to see a repeated pattern here. Most frequently occurring symptoms and cloudless those sensations of heaviness, tightness, perceived swelling, hardness, achiness, pain, physical activity. You're going to see that in the lower limbs, there are more symptoms that occur more frequently than in the other groups that I've talked to you about. So these patients have a higher number of symptoms in general when we talk to them about their problems and when they write them on the scales. These are the ones that by far and away are the most intense to them, you'll see again this resource allocation issue, sexuality coming into play, and hobbies and recreational activities for lower limbs. When people can no longer do that type of activity, they can become very, very profoundly depressed, withdraw, stop moving, and hibernate many times at home. The most emotional piece for this group is also related to this resource allocation and the sexuality pieces. So you should be seeing some themes here. Okay. So the lower limb patients tell us, I'm conscious about my appearance. I'm very concerned. I don't have hope anymore that this leg can get better. Hygiene is an issue that frequently arises because many of the patients complain as their limbs continue to swell, that they can't stay clean. And this lack of cleanliness impacts a lot of areas of their life, as you can well imagine. And just general comfort. The swelling began in my pelvis. Now even sitting is painful. So the swelling for this patient, again, began in the, in the pelvis area of the midline. But it moved on into both of the lower limbs. So for this patient, even the simple act of sitting and listening to someone talk like you are, became something that was almost intolerable. Now, you can see that there are shared symptoms across all of these types of body areas, which include the swelling issues, the heaviness, tightness, pain and discomfort, fatigue, and emotional distress, and body image and appearance. And those are probably not a surprise to any of you. But the take-home message is, patients in that we collected data on had secondary and primary lymphedemas. And what we have identified through our work is that regardless of the cause of the swelling, these symptoms affect these patients very similarly. So there is more that unites primary and secondary lymphedema patients than we might have historically thought. So, Clearly, if you have lymphedema, it impacts the quality of your life. And these are the quality of life dimensions that we have seen impacted through our work. And I'm not going to take all day to go over them, but we're going to just briefly talk about that in terms of the physical 
uh, dementia, fatigue, loss of function, sleeping difficulties are very problematic for your quality of life. Psychological distress can make you an emotional basket case. As can body image and total lack of confidence that your body is going to do what you want it to do anymore. Socially, there may be financial problems related to requiring limp resources to treat the limbs or the abdomens or the trunks. But you also may make long job changes that lower your income, which happens to many patients in the US. Social withdrawal, changes in lifestyles, time management, these are all issues that can be very problematic. And all of them have seemed very negative because for those dimensions, we're consistently giving negative feedback from our patients about their quality of life. This is the one I want to spend just a little bit of time on because the spiritual dimension of quality of life actually is not always negative in our patients. We have about half who say development of lymphedema has caused a crisis of faith. They feel angered and abandoned because they may have survived a cancer or some other insult to their body, only to be stricken again by lymphedema. We also have an equal number of people who take a look at their life when they develop lymphedema and set new priorities and tell us that they've developed a new appreciation for life. And many of them say, if we had to pick between cancer reoccurrence and swelling from a treatment that saved our lives, we'll go with the swelling any time. So there are people who manage to have some spiritual uh, reawakenings when they develop this. So it is possible to have an acceptable quality of life despite having lymphedema if you pay attention to the complexity of the symptoms and try to treat all of your issues and manage all of your patients' issues, not just the swelling that they have. And management sometimes is as simple. It's asking them if they're having any other problems and giving them a forum to talk about what's happening with them. So I'm encouraging all of us in research and healthcare to move away from what is the common definition of lymphedema which is that it's just a physiological condition in which fluid and protein accumulate in the interstitial space. That's the space between your cells where that fluid hangs out. But to expand it to acknowledge that the condition is associated with development of physical and psychosocial symptoms that also require management. And that we should all work with our patients to help them take care of themselves, not just the swelling. And there are many things we need to consider when we do this. We need to consider that lymphedema is a systemic issue and it doesn't occur in isolation from the rest of the body. And that self-care can occur in isolation if you're going to have a good quality of life. Overall physical health, emotional well-being, social and spiritual issues can and should be addressed. The role of therapists is sometimes to identify the problems and then refer them to other caregivers or other support systems such as clergy to help people deal with this. But it's always your role to have a forum for patients to be able to express whatever they would like to tell you about the lymphedema experience, not just the swell. These are some areas that should be assessed when you see patients. They're a little broader than what you uh, might, but to have Overall quality of health, we would like at least everyone in the room to leave thinking, do I ask my patients about preventative care? Because we don't want people walking around with poor vision if they need glasses, bad hearing if they need hearing aids, and uh, uh, cervical cancer if they're not getting their pap smears. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, if you're going to help your patients with lymphedema have a high quality of life, you need to think proactively in all of these areas. In summary, lymphedema is challenging, but it's possible to manage it. And I will leave you with food for thoughts. We're currently doing a study and did a lot of focus groups with patients and asked them to tell us what areas of life they would most like to have help with. These are what the patients told us they would like us to do. And we have a web-based intervention now with modules for each of these 12 areas to try to do it. But as you will see, it wasn't just how to manage the swelling. That's here, okay? There are 11 other areas that they identified as being as important as the swelling. Thank you.
Thank you, Sheila. I think that last slide really highlights the uh, looking after the whole person and not just the limb. And uh, we, we're running behind time, but are there a couple of um, questions that Shelley could answer? Yes. I'm just curious that um, the wholeness of life um, has been addressed in terms of personal care, coping with everyday living, engagement with, you know, uh, leisure activities. Um, there is an absence of, of um, discussion on what it is with work, with our working aged um, patients, or aren't, your, aren't many of your patients working? I, I just couldn't quite work out why work wasn't talked about. Um, about 60% of the patients in these studies are employed. The reason work wasn't talked about was because that was not viewed by the patients as a severe of a problem for them as all these other issues. This is patient-reported data, and uh, we've done uh, some studies to try to look at the economic effects uh, of lymphedema and work involvement, and it just never rises to the forefront from the patient's perspective like all of these other things do. But we do ask about it. It just doesn't uh, rise to this level, which is surprising to me in some ways, given that 60% are unemployed. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We're, uh, with the Faculty of Business and Economics, um, looking at the whole issue of impact of lymphedema at the workplace, and issues like absenteeism, time off work with um, cellulitis, impact on promotion, um, absenteeism, presenteeism, in other words, people staying at work um, so they don't be made redundant. Um, you don't take their sleeve off when they're at work. Um, how their work colleagues interact with them. So we, we're still, um, and we're about to do a, a national survey of those dimensions. So it's, it's, it's an area we're very, very interested in. I can see some of our investigators here. Yes. Sheila, thank you very much for the talk today and uh, thanks for coming out. Well, it's very, uh, I'm a lymphedema uh, patient as well, so all of that made sense to me. Um, these modules here, are part of a program that uh, someone like myself would be able to get access to? Um, the question was, are the modules part of a program? We have a study funded by the American Cancer Society right now um, that is only for breast cancer survivors. And yes, people around the world can be in the study. Once that study is over, these things will become available outside of the study. We have to contain it to the study right now. Okay. But we actually think there will be some national organizations in the U.S. that will make these permanently accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker um, is Jessica uh, Corso. Um, he's a PhD candidate from the Department of Psychology at Macquarie University, who is researching the psychosocial predictors of patient adherence in women living with breast cancer lab. Yeah. 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 Let's welcome Jessica. <laughs> so good afternoon everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be here and learn from you all as well as share some of the preliminary results from research we are conducting on patient adherence in women living with breast cancer related lymphedema. So specifically today, I'm going to be discussing and comparing the psychosocial factors that underlie patient adherence in women with breast cancer related lymphedema that are at risk of developing lymphedema with those patients who have developed uh, breast cancer related lymphedema. So there are a number of self-management recommendations given to patients with lymphedema that include wearing a compression garment, following good skin care, and special exercises. But despite the importance um, and how critical these recommendations are for managing lymphedema, previous studies have estimated um, levels of adherence are suboptimal, ranging from as low as 13% in some cases up to 79% depending on the behavior uh, that's being measured. So, for example, 
adherence to something like skincare is generally quite high, whereas adherence to some of the other recommendations, such as exercise and compression garments, is lower. So another reason there is quite a range in the estimates of adherence is that the, there are inconsistencies in how adherence at lymphedema self-management is defined and measured. So for example, some researchers define adherence according to how frequently a patient is performing a behavior, um, whereas others define it as a percentage of time that a patient is following the therapist's recommendations. Previous research with the at-risk population have identified a range of psychosocial factors that may be important for understanding um, adherence. <coughs> Breast cancer survivors who are at risk of developing lymphedema are given a set of recommendations to follow, um, a series of risk management strategies uh, that are aiming to reduce their risk of developing lymphedema and these behaviors are very similar to the self-care recommendations given to lymphedema patients. So things like skin care um, and taking steps to reduce risk of infection. So previous research with the at-risk population have identified that knowledge about lymphedema is predictive of patient adherence, as well self-efficacy, so patients' beliefs and their ability to perform the self-recommendations and incorporate them into their daily and weekly routine. Self-regulation of affect is another factor predictive of adherence. So this is a patient's uh, beliefs about their ability to manage any distress that arises as a result of, of their lymphedema. As well, stronger beliefs in the controllability of lymphedema and the negative consequences of lymphedema predict patient adherence. And finally, lymphedema-related lymphedema distress is another predictor of adherence or non-adherence in that case. However, no known research to date has looked at whether or not these particular psychosocial factors are predictive of adherence in women who have developed breast cancer-related lymphedema. So the aim of this study that I'll be discussing today was to determine if the factors underlying adherence in the at-risk population also predict adherence in women diagnosed with breast cancer-related lymphedema. So for this study, English-speaking adult women who've been diagnosed with breast cancer-related lymphedema were recruited from a community-based organization, the Breast Cancer Network of Australia, as well as three local lymphedema clinics here in Sydney. Respondents from the Breast Cancer Network of Australia were recruited by uh, an email invitation that was sent from a contact person from within the organization. And a URL linked to this online survey was provided by email, and respondents from the lymphedema clinics were invited directly by lymphedema therapists who provided these their patients with an invitational letter about the research, and this letter also included a link to the online study. Participants completed one online survey that was estimated to take approximately 20 minutes to complete. So we had 200 women consent to participate in the study, and the final sample consisted of 169 um, women after we removed incomplete data. So demographic and uh, information collected included age, income, education level, marital status, um, ethnicity, and employment status. Participants also in completed uh, information about their medical history, including details about their breast cancer treatment and um, their lymphedema, Huntington's diagnosis, for example. Knowledge related to each self-management recommendation was assessed using a series of counterbalanced true-false items. And this was assessed similar, in a similar way as previous lymphedema studies with the average population. 
Seven self-management recommendations were uh, chosen for the measure of adherence based on clinical guidelines and recommendations from lymphedema therapists. Respondents were asked to indicate their therapist prescribed recommendation, so the frequency with which they were uh, recommended to follow each behavior, as well as their self-reported to adherence to each behavior. So adherence was calculated for each behavior separately, as well as a total adherence indicator based on the sum score across all seven behaviors. And this is a unique way of measuring adherence. The majority of previous studies don't often compare the prescribed recommendations with the patient's self-reported adherence. Illness beliefs were measured using the illness revised illness perception questionnaire. And this questionnaire is one that has been validated in a wide range of patient populations, including uh, cancer patients. And it consists of a series of statements uh, that ask the participant to indicate to what extent they agree or disagree with. So some examples here from the subscales, measuring um, their beliefs in the consequences of lymphedema, the, control, the controllability of lymphedema, their own personal control, so what they can do to determine whether or not um, the lymphedema gets better or worse, or the treat, beliefs about the treatment control of lymphedema, so the negative effects of lymphedema can be prevented by my treatment. And finally, emotional representations, so statements like, I get depressed when I think about my lymphedema. We measured self-efficacy and self-regulation of affect in a similar way as to the previous lymphedema studies with the at-risk population. Using statements similar to that from the IPQR, where women indicated the degree to which they agreed uh, or disagreed with, with the statements. So for self-efficacy, the item was, I believe, I have the ability to make the necessary lifestyle changes to carry out the relevant self-care practices, whereas for self-regulation of affect, the two items used were beliefs about ability to calm themselves down when anxious or worried about lymphedema, and beliefs about their ability to limit the amount of stress experienced as a result of lymphedema. So, Descriptive statistics were calculated for the demographic, medical history, and the outcome variable or adherence. The mean age of our sample was 57 and a half years, and the mean time since lymphedema diagnosis was five and a half years, with some women in the study being newly diagnosed and others having lived with lymphedema for over 10 years. The mean number of behaviors adhered to was 5.29 out of seven. So these are the seven behaviors that we measured, so the seven self-care recommendations that we measured. Approximately 19.5% of uh, participants adhered to all seven behaviors. We can see that adherent, levels of adherence were lowest to self-lymphatic drainage um, and highest to skin care. Also, in light of recent evidence that compression garments are particularly important for managing lymphedema, um, it's important to note that adherence to compression garments, approximately 30% of the women or a third of the sample was not following their therapist's recommendations for wearing their garments. So this figure here shows the correlations between psychosocial variables and the outcome variable adherence. We also looked at the correlation between the demographic and medical history variables and adherence and found that chemotherapy, hormone replacement therapy, and time since lymphedema diagnosis were all associated with adherence. For the psychosocial variables, it was knowledge and personal control that were associated with adherence. So to look at um, predictors of adherence, 
The medical history variables were included as covariates, and the predictor variables were personal control and knowledge. And the results indicated a significant model from the results of multiple linear regression analysis. And psychosocial variables accounted for just 3% of the additional variance when looking at adherence. Of the psychosocial variables, we found that personal control was a significant predictor of adherence. And we also run a series of analyses to look at compression garments separately instead of, um, in addition to looking at total adherence across all behaviors. And the results of those analyses didn't differ um, from the total adherence index. Okay, so. Overall, the mean level of adherence was moderate, with participants following an average of five out of seven behaviors um, as they were prescribed by their therapists. And these findings are comparable to previous research with um, breast cancer-related lymphedema patients, but still well below 100% uh, adherence to prescription. In addition, it's important to note that only one out of five women were performing all seven recommendations as frequently as prescribed by their therapists. Levels of adherence were low to behaviors such as performing self-lymphatic drainage and wearing compression garments, but high amongst um, for proper hygiene and skin care. And this finding is not surprising. For behaviors like skin care, it's likely a component of these women's daily routines prior to developing lymphedema. Whereas for some of these other recommendations, uh, such as for um, following certain exercises, performing self-lymphatic drainage, wearing a compression garment, these involve learning new skills and incorporating new behaviors into their routines. So it's not surprising that adherence is lower for those recommendations. Contrary to prediction, however, the psychosocial factors that were important for understanding adherence in the at-risk population were not, did not explain a substantial amount of the variance, variance in women who have been diagnosed with lymphedema. There were similarities, however, between the two populations in that um, beliefs about the controllability of lymphedema and knowledge about lymphedema were associated with adherence. So where do we go from here? Other potential psychosocial factors that could be influencing adherence are things like the self-reported um, barriers to adherence that patients have uh, previously reported, things like physical limitations or symptoms of lymphedema, the financial cost of treatment, social isolation, and time management issues. These barriers are very similar to those reported by patients with other chronic illnesses that involve a level of self-care, such as diabetes, arthritis, and asthma. So it may be informative to look at these other chronic illnesses to help identify factors that may be underlying adherence in the lymphedema context. So for example, patients with diabetes um, are provided with a self-care regimen to follow similar to uh, lymphedema patients and some of the specific behaviors are similar, um, such as the patients with leg ulcers are recommended to wear compression garments. And in the diabetes context, what researchers have found is that patient-provider communication is a significant predictor of adherence. So this may also translate into the lymphedema context as well. And finally, it's important to consider one limitation of this, this study when interpreting the results is that this was um, all self-reported data. So we didn't have an objective measure of lymphedema diagnosis or lymphedema stage. That's it for me.